All right. Well, my name is Tyler Heath. I'm the inventory manager with Interabang Books, and this is part of our new Interabang Books author chat series. And we are so lucky to have the poet Victoria Chang joining us today to talk about her book, Obit, which was out from Copper Canyon in April, as well as a brand new middle grade book, Love, Love, which is out through Sterling on April, I'm sorry, June 23rd. The publication date got moved for obvious reasons. Um, so we're excited to talk about these two books today. Um, Victoria, thank you so much for making time. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. And I wanted to start if you could just um, sort of give our listeners um, some insight into this project. What is this project, Obit? How did it begin? Um, some information like that. Sure, yeah. Um, so my mom passed away in 2015 and she died from a long illness and it's called pulmonary fibrosis. And it's when your lungs sort of, for whatever reason, just scar and you gradually suffocate to death. So it's not the prettiest illness in the world. Um, and my dad had a stroke maybe like 12 years ago now. And so they, they populate my poems because they have been a very large part of my poems for a long time or my life. And so they're, you know, my life and my poems are kind of the same thing. Um, but, but my mom died in 2015. So you know, it just, uh, it's been an interesting 12 years um, since my dad had the stroke. And so I, I don't know, I think, I think I just, um, I didn't want to write sort of that traditional elegy. Um, and I've, I've loved reading all the elegies that I've read, but I just didn't feel like any of them sort of really matched my own experience and the things that I was feeling. And so, um, yeah, I was listening to a NPR and they were talking about this documentary called Obit and I just loved how that word sounded and um, I went home and I just wrote all of these obituary shaped poems that are like little rectangles or I think you could see those and um, everything sort of dies so it's not just the mother dying but it's the little bits and pieces of everything that died and so that's sort of how that came about and then I wrote maybe um, I wrote over two weeks, like like maybe almost the whole thing. And then I spent the next couple of years writing a few more, doing some other things with the book and, you know, revising and things like that. So that's how that project came about. Awesome. Um, I, I agree. I've, I've read a lot of elegies recently and this one is so different. This one feels like a true, just intellectual inquiry. There's a lot more questions throughout than trying to solve anything, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, yeah. and a lot of the other elegies I've read have sort of surrounded suicide. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking of um, Ghost Of by um, mm -hmm. Anna Coy Wynn, which is so fantastic. I love it. So good. Oh my gosh, it was amazing. Yeah. Um, so Matt good. Rasmussen's Black Aperture. So good. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. It's, it's perfect. And then even, you know, Four Scanders Be With, there's some touches of elegiac components um, there, but yours is very, very different. I really enjoyed uh, that contrast. And I was thinking about um, the structure of the book really stays kind of almost private and personal until the very last, in my opinion, Obit. Mm -hmm. And I was interested in, there's almost this opening up to a, um, a collective type of grief mm -hmm. with the last Obit, which references the Parkland shooting. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about this moment right now with the killing of George Floyd and the differences between collective grief and private grief. You know, what does that look like? What does that mean? And I feel like this last obit really kind of starts to go there. And I was wondering if you could, if you could read that one. Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to. And this one, yeah, this one is actually, it was a prompt. So um, the editor of this journal called terrain.org um, had asked me after seeing a bunch of these obits around to write towards their Dear America series. And so that's sort of why it, it feels slightly different. I'll read it to you. America. America died on February 14, 2018. And my dead mother doesn't know since her death, America has died a series of small deaths, each one less precise than the next. My tears are now shaped like hooks, but my heart is damp still. If it is lucky, it is in the middle of its beats. 
The unlucky dead children hold telegrams they must hand to a woman at a desk. The woman will collect their belongings and shadows. My dead mother asks each of these children if they know me, have seen me, how tall my children are now. They will tell her that they once lived in Florida, not California. She will see the child with a hole in his head. She will blow the dreams out of the hole like dust. I used to think death was a kind of anesthesia. Now I imagine long lines, my mother taking in all the children. I imagine her touching their hair, how she might tickle their knees to make them laugh. The dead hold the other half of our ticket. The dead are an image of wind, and when they comb their hair, our trees rustle. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I wonder if you could speak to that idea of a what could be a collective grief as a country, as opposed mm -hmm. to the maybe the earlier obits that don't reference such a, a public um, tragedy. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, you know, when you're grieving someone's death, I feel like it is very personal and private. And even while I was writing those, you know, grieving poems to my own experience in my mother's passing, I always felt like they could, the risk of them could be that they're like little clamps, shells that just snap shut, you know? Um, and so while I was writing the whole book, I was constantly thinking about other people's grief. So there, it did sort of thread through my feelings and thinking about writing this, these poems. And then it wasn't until that Dear America poem did I really open it up um, to, that sort of collective grief, very similar to the collective grief that we are all feeling right now. Um, and I, I feel like have felt, you know, I think we've been grieving as a country for so many hundreds of years, but even in the last 10 years, five years, it seems like it's just accumulating like little bricks, you know, um, with the school shootings and then with, um, you know, the political situation, it's kind of accumulated. And I know that everyone's experience is slightly different, you know, for black people, um, people of color, other people, like I, I feel like their back grief was never, never left, right? And it's been around the whole time, but I feel like what's been happening lately and also with um, the Floyd situation and the killing, I feel like now we can all be sort of together in that grieving and I feel like that's sort of where we are today literally as we sit here while people are out protesting and so it's I feel like it's a different time um for me because I'm well I'm old I'm not that old and I haven't <laughs> experienced to that you know uh, Martin Luther King I've watched the videos I've I've gone to see you know the speeches online I've you know I I've seen the interviews but I wasn't there, you know? And so I feel like in my lifetime, um, this feels like, uh, you know, Parkland felt like that to me. This feels like that to me. Um, you know, when Trump was elected felt like that to me. So it just, I feel like, it, you know, this is, I don't know, this is maybe what people felt like in a different time of history. And so um, maybe you can ask people who are like 90 or 100, if this feels any different to them, or if this, you know, like what that, how the collective grief sort of has changed over history, but we're in it, you know, and we're, um, and it's, again, for me, it's like, this is a special moment, but I think for a lot of people, this is, it's, this is what it's been like for hundreds of years. And, and I feel like, um, you know, I feel like a solidarity with, with, the, with maybe a certain population of, the, of, of human beings right now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I was struck by, cause I was I'm thinking of this moment um, as it's so palpable um, for me in a, in a way that it hasn't before. Um, and I know I'm privileged to be able to say that. Yeah. But you had a, a line early on, um, and this is in one of your elegies, uh, Victoria Chang died, uh -huh. Obits rather, um, in talking about physical letters of the alphabet. And you describe it as the letters tagged her and ran into the cornfields. The police came and shined their lights onto the field 
started shooting the letters, even though they had their hands up. Sometimes they shot the letters twice just to make sure. Mm -hmm. And I, I, just, I just can't help but think of the intersection of language and violence mm -hmm. and how important language is for those that are suffering and other to have. Um, mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I mean, when I wrote that, I was thinking of, um, you know, black people being shot. That's exactly what I was thinking about. And, and how, uh, how many times, and this, that was written years ago, and how police violence towards black men in particular, it's been so awful for so long. And that there have been so many instances, even in the last five years, where black men would hold their hands up, they, their backs would be turned, they wouldn't have any weapons, yet they would be shot for no reason besides the fact that they're Black men. And so when I wrote that, it was sort of, you know, that those are the images that I had in mind, but I was using letters. But the opponents start that way. I think they started as letters. And then I, that those, you know, I think what, what happens in your life when you're writing is that current events just sort of seep through. And so I definitely had those images and, and I, I did write towards those ideas too and and because it was you know it's been happening it's not just you know floyd it's it's almost it feels like it's almost it's daily let's be honest but in terms of um you know in terms of the the ones that have sort of risen to the news level that have been so egregious have it feels like it's been constant and so it that i think that was what i was thinking and so you did pick up on that and i think that that's what happens throughout is just as you mentioned, everything can become grief. Everything is sort of constantly shifting, um, changing shapes, as you, as you mentioned throughout here. Um, and the idea of language is ever present here. The medium is language, but it's really sort of um, made even more complicated because of your father's stroke. Right. And the sort of the lack of, um, the disappearance of language, I would say. Mm -hmm, and um, right. there's one poem that really stood out to me, especially the, the final line, and that's the, um, talking about your father, it's later in the book, and it's about the, the, um, the Obit is for Obsession, mm -hmm. and it's on page 80. And um, I really feel like this final image is just um, a fantastic representation of, of what language becomes throughout. And I was hoping you'd read this one. On page 80? Yes. Okay, this one's called Obsession. Obsession, born on January 20th, 1940, never died after the stroke, but grew instead. The stroke gained an oak door, not just hard, but impenetrable. The obsessions lived in solitude behind the oak door. After his stroke, the obsession took my father to the gym to walk on the treadmill. He walked as if through a wildfire. He walked so much, he disappeared. His brain now had an accent and no one could understand how to stop him from learning the new language. My mother called and said he fell on the treadmill, hit his head, blood thinner spread his blood like moonlight. They drilled holes in his head, vacuumed out the blood and more words. My father was finally arrested. He turned in the rest of his words. They bound his tongue and he dreamed in blank paper. That's amazing. I was, I, yeah, I stopped reading after that because I needed to pause. It was so good. <laughs> um, thank you for that. Um, one thing I couldn't help but think about is, you know, you're an artist working with a medium we use every single day, um, but are heightening it. But when, when this started to happen to your father, um, I'm thinking of even the way that the, um, the earlier there's a voicemail reference and sort of the transcription is even off um, with the phrase, I love you. I, I wonder how your relationship to language has changed in, in, through this experience, if it has. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate so much more since my dad had a stroke and he had a stroke when he was, I mean, pretty young in his sixties. And um, 
I was only like in my 30s, late 30s when he had a stroke. And so I was still kind of like happy and bouncy and cheerful. And um, and uh, I think after he had a stroke, I began to realize that there are going to be a series of losses <laughs> as we get older and older. For some people, you know, they're like really young. They may lose a parent or you know, they may get sick. And I think that's more of the anomaly. I think for just, you know, regular people, things, they're just gradual losses throughout time. And, you know, I've, I had my own sort of losses before that too. You know, I had a miscarriage and, you know, it's not like I was without any grief and things like that, but, but when my dad lost his language and he, uh, he's so, he's such a big personality. He had such a big personality. He's so chatty. Um, was really fun to talk to and and uh, and when he lost all of that and he's so smart and he's just really interesting um, when he lost it it was like oh my gosh this thing that I have that I've totally taken for granted I started to really appreciate it and that sort of my relationship with language changed once my dad had a stroke and I never thought it would. And, you know, you just, you don't think about those things, but now looking back at it in your question, I would say I started to appreciate everything more, especially language and my ability to talk, um, my ability to think and articulate in ways that he like lost overnight. And so um, yeah, I mean, I guess I also worked harder on my poems because I also thought, well, gosh, how much time do I have left? I, that could happen to me. Um, and so I don't take anything for granted anymore, especially language. And, um, and yeah, I mean, I think it changed my relationship with poems and my relationship with reading and also writing. Like I took all of it way more seriously once my dad had a stroke, whereas before, I liked writing poetry and I enjoyed it and I did it, but I, w I can't say it was, it was a very serious hobby. Like I took it very seriously, but after he had a stroke, I would say, I was like, no, no, this is really important to me. Um, and it's who I am. And so I think everything changed after he had a stroke for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, and the other ways this book discusses language is sort of um, in the ambiguousness of sort of, um, medical staff trying to relay messages. I'm thinking of one moment in one obit where the nurse calls you and says, be prepared. Mm -hmm. And there's a sort of perplexing sort of um, experience of not really knowing what that means. Right. Uh, what does that mean? How do you be prepared? Yeah. Right. Well, it is really interesting because I think about that a lot and I know exactly where I was when she called me and told me um, and and I do actually think it's such a silly thing to say to someone because they have no idea, you know, and, and I don't know if anyone really understands what it feels like to have a parent die until a parent dies. And, and I think that's totally fine. And so to tell someone to be prepared is just dumb. <laughs> and, and it's like, because you, you really can't. And I always say that, um, you know, once someone has a parent that dies, especially when they're close to, which I was to my mom and my dad in different ways, it's like you get a uh, a card, you know, you're now a card carrying member of the, the you know, the, the, the orphan club, you know, um, my dad died when he had a stroke to me, even though he's right down the road at a facility. I've never had another conversation with him that's vaguely cohesive. And, um, and so, I I feel like you can't and it's totally fine and when people have parents still I'm like you're I don't say you're so lucky you know I think they're so lucky but I don't say it and I I, I hope they appreciate the time that they have left with their their family um, but when their family does pass you know I, I feel like I can now help them more you know because I think it's so shocking and so jarring um, and so painful for so many people, um, probably all people that I feel then suddenly we're, we're, we're closer because of that, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, one thing that you're alluding to, I think here's, and what I see is um, all over the book is this idea of representation. 
or the inability to represent something or to get at it. Um, I feel like that's kind of what the Ovids do. They're sort of trying at different angles to get at maybe the same thing. But I think what's smart about these poems is, is that they feel suspicious of that possibility. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And so I was, uh, one poem that really s stood out that does that exactly is um, Empathy on 65, if you could okay. read that one. Sure. Empathy. Empathy died sometime before January 20th, 2017. The gate vanished, but we don't know when. The doorbell vanished, the train stopped moving, someone stole the North Pole sign. I am you and you and you, but there are so many obstacles between us. I can never feel my mother's illness or my father's dementia. The black notes on the score are only representations of sound. The keys must knock certain strings, which are made of steel. Steel is made of iron and carbon from the earth. Why do we make things like a piano that try to represent beauty or pain? Why must we always draw what we see? Just copy it, my mother used to say about drawing. The artist is only visiting pain, imagining it. We praise the artist, not the apple, not the apple's shadow, which is murdered slowly. There must be some way of drawing a picture so that it doesn't become an elegy. Thank you. I'm curious, um, after you finish this work and are reading it and have some distance from it, I wonder what your relationship is to these poems, if they feel at all like myth, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I think that happens with any book, but this book in particular um, is a weird book. You know, I remember when the first time I read poems from this book, which it wasn't a book, they're just papers, I was almost shaking because I was so sad. <laughs> I was reading some of them and the feelings uh, reading it kind of re-triggered myself. And that's actually what happens when we edit poems, I feel like. Um, you just you just or edit anything really what you're doing is you're if it's a, a trauma or a situation that was painful what we're doing to ourselves is sort of like here let me cut myself again and you know strangle myself again and um and so i feel like when i first read it it was very very raw and i i literally could hear my voice quivering and um but then as time has gone on as you would imagine or as one would imagine um you know, I don't feel those things as much, but even though, you know, sometimes I'll just pick this book up and start reading and I'll be like, oh, wow, that's really sad, but it won't feel like my sadness anymore. It'll feel like someone else's sadness. So, um, and people write me a lot to tell me how they're really sad. <laughs> the poems are really sad and yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll feel like I understand them from their perspective now versus, oh, my sadness. Um, and obviously I'm, you know, it's like, there's not a day that passes when I don't feel sad about my mother, um, but it's not as raw anymore. And so I think I wrote these at that kind of, uh, at a moment when it was very raw. And so I think it, that seeps through in these poems, but not so raw because I wrote them like maybe eight months after my mom died almost like intentionally, I feel like. I felt like if I wrote them too soon and I didn't want to um, write them at all, that I feel like they, they would be different. But I wanted just a little bit of space, like maybe an inch from that grief so that I could interrogate grief, you know, so I could think through it and have space. Whereas before, like after my mom died, it was just like, you know, who knew one had so many tears, right? And so it's a very different experience now when I, um, you know, I'm reading it, you know, even aloud, I still feel, I, I'm like, I recognize it, but it doesn't feel quite as close. Yeah. yeah. And I think you, t I think you talk about um, the, another line in there about sort of um, images as sort of creating distance. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if, if that just sort of naturally happens with any art is, um, even though, as you mentioned, you are trying to interrogate, it feels like it's sort of, um, conflict here i'm trying to get close to something but it's not the experience is just not there 
Right. It's impossible. I mean, words, this has been said so many times that it's a cliche, but I mean, you can't describe things. It's impossible. Like you can't fully, you can't ever fully describe how we feel. You can get close, but you can't get there. And what is there anyway? I mean, what is a feeling? You know, what is an object? And um, yeah, what is language? It's just a way to represent something. But can you ever represent something besides what represents itself is itself. And so nothing to describe it can ever really ever get there, uh, which is the beauty of it, because I love chasing things that I can't have. <laughs> so um, that's, that's so fun to me. And um, I do think that's partly why maybe poetry is fun and enjoyable to me. It's, it's, I think of it as such a joy, even though it's so sad sometimes, and I'm definitely a poet of sadness. Um, but I love trying. And I think the trying and the chasing of that is what appeals to me about making art because you'll never quite get there <laughs> whatever there means yeah so. yeah there's a there's a line that really i felt summed that up in an amazing way here that you write this is in the um the sonnet sequence and um which i thought was really interesting because the way that the i'll just show the way that it's represented on the page feels very um, free compared to the obits, which are almost look rigid and almost, mm -hmm. almost, um, I don't know, Bauhaus, whatever. But I ended up stalling in a little bit on the, the, the sonnet sequences intentionally, the way that the words are, 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 are sort of positioned in a way that made the language just more concrete and tactile. I thought that was a really smart formal choice, but you write here, and because perfect darkness is impossible to create, I seek it as an eye seeks the black cavity of another eye. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's, that's sort of the chase that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And that sort of, that connection with something else that might reflect back that experience. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. and, and I thought that I thought that that summed it up really well. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of amazed how you can remember where all of these poems are. I see you flipping. I see your pages tagged, but I'm like, how can you find everything? I don't even know where things are. People always yeah. tell me oh, on page this or page that. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the other thing I noticed throughout was this idea of um, hands it's sort of all over the place, this idea of mm -hmm. sort of the activity with hands. In the sonnet sequence, there's one that's explicitly about hands. And it reminded me of the Matt Rasmussen um, elegy in 10 parts that he has where he talks about constantly finding his brother's hands mm -hmm. um, and that his brother's hands sort of like try to turn the steering wheel into oncoming mm -hmm. traffic, really mischievous. And I feel like the hands here are, are, are different in, in many respects. Um, there's also the images of, um, you know, your, um, a photo shows my mother holding my hand. I was nine. I never touched her hand again until the day before she died. Um, mm -hmm. there's, there's so much activity with the hands and I felt like it was a, you know, I'm, I'm still here. I'm connected to the world. This is real because I can touch it in contrast with the sort of what's happening, you know, with the disease, which is I'm sort of fading. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that that, I don't, I, I don't know if, what the intent was behind that, but I felt that contrast throughout. Yeah, no, it's really interesting because I think all of my books and I think a lot of other people's books have these re re recurring images. And I often don't notice them, but other people notice them. So in this new manuscript I'm working on, you know, someone, my friend just read it and was like, you know, there are these lemons everywhere or there are these, you know, and I do think, um, you know, I have a small lemon uh, bucket. It's not a tree. I mean, it's a little bush in a large bucket, a barrel bucket, and it sits right there out the window. And so I always see the lemons there. And so they just appear in a lot of my poems. Um, but I don't, yeah, I don't know what my obsession is with hands, but um, I believe you that they're everywhere. Um, I'm sure there are other 
recurring images too that shadows shadows yeah no shadows are so that's such an easy one with these look like shadows of each other yeah the the page they look like that they're and like what you described too before how they felt sort of bound i mean they are almost like little coffins you know um they're meant the form was meant to sort of tighten so that i can really mess around within that space and so that's um that they almost felt suffocating too which is i think why the um the middle sonnet sequence was fun to do the spaces and things to kind of break things up and the little tankas and they're just all, again just meant to sort of break things up a little bit otherwise it's kind of heavy for kind of a long time so yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. i wonder if we could use the hands imagery to transition to your new book coming out sure yeah because it what, what i noticed there as well was sort of um and what's fantastic about this is the middle grade book mm-hmm. uh, which is which is great especially in the subject matter um but there's the use of hands to sort of ultimately express something that's very secretive. Right. Um, and I'm, I'm curious how you got in the headspace to go from this just stunning intellectual inquiry to this sort of true narrative, um, yeah. looking at adolescent, um, two adolescent girl sisters, mm-hmm. um, I know it's semi-autobiographical, but um, what made you want to pursue this type of uh, genre? Yeah, I mean, I feel like some of us, many of us probably, I'm sure you do too, have things that we can't not write about. So, and we've tried to write about them through poems. We've tried to write about them through essays and fiction and it just you keep like it just keeps recurring in different ways and and yeah I mean like I have children so it makes sense to read to know what's going on in the children's field to help them find books to read and middle grade is sort of the age bracket that my kids are in now and so I kind of started reading middle grade just for fun and it suddenly occurred to me that there was this whole area called middle grade verse novels so novels that were written in poem format and I thought oh that'd be kind of fun to try (laughs) um it's so hard and uh I mean all writing is joyfully hard but yeah I thought that this would be a really nice place um given the age range and the sisters being that age and sort of trying to write a, a true narrative like things actually happen, not necessarily linearly, but that there's a storyline and there's conflict and there's some resolution. And, and so there are characters. And so I thought um, it'd be kind of a neat thing to try. And I really enjoyed it. I mean, it was a fun process. And so, uh, but yeah, I admire children's writers in different ways because I feel like they, it's a whole different craft and it's an entire different world out there. But I, I, I want, I've always wanted to write that story. I just didn't know in, you know, how or where and I've tried to, and I think the middle grade space is a nice place for it to sit in the end. Mm-hmm. And, and without giving too much away, because it is, it truly is a mystery. Um, yeah. I, I would say it really is. Um, yeah. You know, could, could you sort of um, discuss the sort of the plot at all? Sure. Yeah, no. um, So I grew up, you know, in a family in Michigan and uh, my own family and um, my sister, my real sister um, is not much older than me. We might as well have been twins, but contrasting twins, you know, Um, she had uh, suffered from and probably still suffers from. We don't really talk about it, but suffers from trichotillomania, which is, uh, you know, an obsessive compulsive um situation where you start pulling you mean people pull out eyelashes um you know their eyebrows or their hair and so yeah it was it just became all encompassing when it started happening and it happened started i think in grade school sometime um and then suddenly it's like the whole family was always obsessed with this thing and um so yeah i mean it was just a big part of my childhood as the other um as the 
the sister sort of not directly experiencing it, but you know, we're never left sort of untouched. And so I wanted to explore what it was like from the, un, you know, that sort of less touched sister, the one that didn't struggle with trichotillomania and, and the re, it, it impacted our relationship, I think. Um, and it changed my relationship with my mother who seemed very, she was very anxious too. So I think like in our family, there are four of us, two were anxious and two were less anxious. I was of the less anxious variety. So I was always sort of tiptoeing, you know, and so it was a childhood that I felt was very much so living in fear, um, secrets. Uh, I was always afraid of things because things seem like they're always going wrong and they're just a lot of whispering and but nobody ever really talked about anything. So um, it was just a weird situation to be in. And um, and yeah, I mean, probably stranger for the actual sister who's experiencing trichotillomania, but I wouldn't know that experience. I wrote it, the story from that other sister's perspective. And so, yeah, the whole book is about sort of that kind of coming of age and um, trying to develop a relationship with the sister. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that's sort of, yeah, I, I think that's it. I kind of gave it all away, but <laughs> yeah, it's okay. <laughs> no, no, there, there's, there's, there's plenty to see here. Um, and I really appreciate the pursuit of this for this age level because my family went through something similar, not with uh, chintillomania at all, but uh, self-harm. And mm. it was, you know, at a, at a young age, it continued um, into, into adulthood. And it was something that no one could mention but there's this tension mm. and the representation in middle grade fiction has just not been there for, I would say it's getting much better, but for, um, you know, mental health at all. And right. so this is such a fantastic way to be able to discuss that. Um, whether it be a, 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 a parent reading this or, or a child and knowing that, um, that representation is, is, is occurring. Um, so right. I'm, I'm really excited for this type of work to be out there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I think before it wasn't really talked about, you know, and I mean, the middle grade books and things were, you know, they, they tend to be sillier, you know, and that's great. Like, it's fun. It's a silly thing. And they kind of are making kids laugh all the time. And, you know, Diary of a Wimpy Kid is a great example of the age bracket that um, people write for. But I definitely think over the last five or 10 years, there have been more, you know, stories where these deeper and harder feelings are there and there's a lot of bullying in there too um you know i grew up in michigan which isn't the most diverse area and so yeah i was brutally bullied all growing up and so i wanted to write about that through that character um and and sort of i guess uh you know out myself for being someone that was bullied because it wasn't something i was i was always ashamed of and as i've gotten older i'm like why am i ashamed those people who bullied me should be ashamed <laughs> so it's taken me a lifetime to realize that oh wait i didn't do anything wrong um and so this book was a part of reckoning with that as well yeah yeah i can relate to that as a, a gay man myself i remember being followed home um w trying to walk home from school and just getting all these questions and I didn't even, I didn't know the answers because I didn't know what I was doing was bad, but you know, and it, it's were just- other kids, kids were asking you questions and as you know, why, why I talked a certain way, why I acted a certain way, why I did certain things. Um, and you know, none of them actually interested in the answers. Right. Um, but um, that fear and that sort of, that anger towards society is there until I can um, relate to somebody else, share an experience, you know, know that I'm not the only one with that. Um, and so I think that's exactly what, what this does, which is, which is fantastic. And I think that the choice of uh, tennis as the sport is great because tennis is such an individual sport. There's no one, maybe there's a coach, but, but in professional tennis, you know, there hasn't been, there's been no coaches allowed. It's up to you. You know, you are out there crowd on your side or not. Right. And you kind of figure it out, um, and so I thought that I thought that was a great um, a great sport to choose to represent this. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and it was sort of fun because I grew up playing tennis, but I, you know, I didn't play super competitively, and so it was fun to make the main character like way better than <laughs> I ever was. <laughs> yeah. 
It's great. That was fun. I was like, yeah, let me make her like super athletic and um and I'm moderately athletic. And so um it was fun to to kind of, you know, embellish certain aspects about the character that made it really enjoyable to write. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm curious if there's uh, I think you mentioned a manuscript. What else are you working on currently? I am working on, well, I finished a book of sort of epistolary essays. So oh. um, yeah, and there, uh, I think that'll be out sometime. I have no idea by Milkweed. Um, and then I'm working on a, just some of these, these poems that, so I hadn't written in years. That's pretty normal for me. And then I went to the, um, the Landon Foundation residency in Marfa, Texas. I'd never gone before and um, never been, I mean, I haven't really spent that much time in Texas, but um, yeah, I started writing poems there. And then I came back in February and I don't know, I just started writing a whole new kind of poem. And so I just wrote a whole, maybe a hundred pages of these things. And so I've been working almost daily um finding sneaking as much time as i can to work on them and i feel like i feel like i'm so tired because i've been working so hard at my job and other things and then obsessed with this manuscript for no particular reason so that's kind of what i'm working on now yeah i'm envious of that work that you have <laughs> that's amazing yeah well i mean the, the obsession. you write too right are you you i imagine you write yeah, but very like, very okay. slowly okay well yeah. there, i mean i i mean think most people write slowly but i think i write i'm such an obsessive person that i have no choice i wish i could write slowly i wish really? yes yes but yes. is your editing um, slowly or is the writing and editing also so that initial gush is more of like barfing is what i would describe it as and i think that um the then it gets hard but I think like the editing which starts pretty quickly after the barfing is um really slow and so hard and some some days I just don't feel very good and so there's nothing you know I get mad or upset if mm -hmm. if I feel like like I just I, I don't I'm not in that that space right but um if I even come up with one good line it could just I'm like on a high for the rest of the day um, and it can carry me into like days of, of feeling high. And so it's, um, yeah, I mean, writing for me is probably some form of, you know, addiction because I really do love those feelings that I have. And so, um, yeah, then I can edit for years. Um, but yeah, I mean, this one, it feels almost, done oddly because it's it's very quick for me between like february or january and now it's not been that long but i think the quarantine also accelerated things for me i've been so busy uh, working all the time but i've also had incredible large blocks of free time too that mm -hmm. i never had before um and so i think i've actually doubled my time in some ways during the quarantine because i don't commute anymore and you know there's just a lot of things I don't have to do and so I have a little more time um, and so I think normally it would have taken me maybe a year but it's only taken me six months which is really strange yeah wow. yeah well, I look forward to it these yeah were just, these were just stunning these yeah I'm encourage everyone to pick this up yeah yeah thank you no yeah. Uh, I like how it's all you're all folded up in there I saw your show your book it's like Oh, you're yeah. like yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> i love that I, I do that too i draw over my i've got books on my table that are all ripped up and yeah they're like i break spines do you oh, break yeah. spines oh yeah i like yeah my books are all broken they're i have entire books that have fallen apart i think there's oh, yeah. a book my merwin book fell apart it's just yeah i don't know Which where merwin is, is it um i'll grab it it's probably here somewhere um Oh yeah, it's this one. This one broke. This is this one. Oh, uh, can you see it? Wait, oh yeah, 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 yeah. You can see it. Can yeah, this one it? is like literally it. The whole spine broke. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so there are like different parts of it and stuff. And so I, I think it's great. I mean, I think it's, that's yeah. what books are for. I, I mean, if they're loved, you know. Yeah, that looks like it's them. becoming a. That's becoming an Anne Carson book. Just yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Black yeah. literature here. This is the back of it. Just. 
some weird black stain. I don't know if it's smoke or what, but it's yeah. there. And it kind of works for this book. That book looks, your book looks really sad. It's all wrinkled. It's gotten wet. Yeah, I have, I have books like that that mean a lot to me. Um, yeah. Yeah, and you know, I just have so many favorites, you know, that I keep going back to. So I think um, that's a really, that's a really good one. And it just to think it's a first book. Oh my gosh, I know. Right? I know. I mean, how do you even top, like in Diana Quay Wynn's book is also a first book, right? Yeah. So how do you go, I mean, I started as a different kind of writer where I just dabbled and didn't have much time and just sort of goofed around, didn't read very much. Really? Um, yeah, I, I've never, I just, for, I mean, I didn't really start taking poetry seriously, seriously, seriously until um, probably in my 40s and not that long ago. And then I did get an MFA in my 30s. And so that was concentrated time, but it's not like after that I had any more time. And so um, I, I, I admire these people who um, come to the craft with so, with like their like, so mature and they're able to write so well at such a early stage in their lives. Um, they're not always young, you know? I mean, first books can come out of people who are in their 50s that are phenomenal, but that seems like they have more life experience. But mm -hmm. some of these people are, like they wrote these books in their 20s. It was like, what was I doing in my 20s? I was definitely sh screwing around in my 20s. I was not living a full life of poetry and taking things seriously. And so, there's a lot, there's a lot to admire about that. And I, I, you know, I, I, I'm really in awe of some of the people's talents at that age, like, you know. Like how did Richard Seiken write Crush at that early of an age? Are you kidding oh, me? Oh yeah. Yeah. That's probably my favorite book of the last, I don't know, when did it come out? Like decades It came ago? out in, I think 2004. Okay, so what years, it's, it's a 16 years ago. Yeah, that's my favorite book of the last 16 years. I, I think it's that, that it is, yeah. Yeah. It's a life, I mean, I do, I did have this conversation with someone where they reread it and they said, you know, they, we were talking about like, how well do books hold up? It has been a long time. And, um, you know, we think the books held up pretty well, <laughs> so, you know, over 16 years, but it's like, I haven't reread it in, in a while. I'll occasionally reread poems and things like that. And, uh, but that book, when it first came out, you do you know that you, as a reader, you hunt for that feeling where you open a book and you're like, oh my God. <laughs> I remember, I still remember reading the very first poem um, and the very first page and I, I see it and I'm like, oh my God, you know, <laughs> that's the feeling I had. Yeah. I had the same experience. That's, yeah, that's interesting. And uh, you picked um, John McCarthy, Scared Violent Like Horses. Yeah, yeah. Shit, that was awesome. That's a really good book. Yeah, yeah. I remember, um, you know, when I was during that prize, uh, putting that manuscript aside and sort of knowing all along that was going to be my choice, but I still asked them for more and just, I just wanted to make sure, but even though I knew right away, I mean, it just, those palms are so good. And so, yeah, it was, that's, that's the fun thing about during you're on like a little treasure hunt. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah I still remember one that line that stood out. It was, uh, she talked about his mother moving around the house, like a dial tone. Mm -hmm. It was just, that did it. Mm -hmm. just, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Once in a while, like McCarthy had these amazing images. Um, yeah. Really gifted and talented and was writing about, subject matter you know of just being over like a fly what is it called the flyover country is yeah. it, i guess what people call it and so i thought that experience and the way he did, depicted it in poems was really beautiful yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah well hey victoria i really appreciate the time you're awesome and um i look forward to uh to reading your new stuff and rereading this one yeah well thank you so much it was so fun to talk to you yeah all right thanks bye okay take care bye